Um, today our session is on EMV, and it's about, all about can you afford not to upgrade. My name is Linda Toth. I'm Director of Standards for Conexus. I have with me two great subject matter experts on EMV. First, I have Cara Gunderson, who I've known for years. Um, she is the POS manager for CITGO, and she's a PCI uh, professional. She also co-chairs the U.S. Payments Forum PetroSIG, as well as chairing the Conexus Data Security Committee, so she's got a lot of experience under her belt. We also are very fortunate this morning to have Jim Linton with us. He is vice president for Folk Oil. They're a 35 multi-branded store chain out of Michigan, and they've actually implemented EMV Outdoor. So he's going to be able to tell us some interesting things about his journey on implementing outdoor EMV. Before we get started on the main topic, I wanted to just spend a few minutes and talk about Conexus. Conexus is the independent and nonprofit trade association for the industry for all things technical. So we do payments, data security, technology. We have 170 plus member companies. And we are the neutral forum where our volunteers, <clears throat> excuse me, come together to do the heavy lifting. We have a very small staff, so we rely on our members um, to really do our work. Um, we do a number of things, including standards. Um, we do data exchange, how devices interoperate and talk to each other in and around the forecourt. We do a lot with uh, data security and helping our retailers understand how to meet that. We also advocate on behalf of the industry, and overall, we improve profitability. We have a booth down on the floor, 3755. So if you have a chance, come down and talk to us, especially if you have some questions about EMV that we don't get a chance to get to. Um, feel free to come down and we can have a chat. I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank our annual Diamond sponsors. Those are the people that allow us to do some of the great work that we do by um, supporting us year round. So after this session, we have really three um, objectives. You should be able to list the risks associated with waiting to convert outdoor. You should be able to estimate your costs if you don't upgrade. And finally, you should be able to analyze the best practices and lessons learned from other retailers. So let's level set this morning and just, I know a lot of you know a lot about EMV, but some of you may be new to it. So let's just level set and talk for a few minutes about what EMV is. So EMV is the chip cards that you probably have in your wallet by now. The EMV is named for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa. These were the founding companies that created the technology. EMV Co. is actually the, the body that maintains the specification, and it's made up of the four U.S. card brands, American Express, Discover, Visa, and MasterCard, along with JCB and China Union Pay. So in order to understand what EMV is, it's important to understand what the MagStripe technology is. Um, this is the magnetic stripe on the back of your card. It's normally either black or silver. And the data is read out of the card by swiping it through the card terminal. And it's important to remember that that data doesn't change over time. It's static. So every time it's read, it's the exact same data. Chip cards, on the other hand, have a secure integrated circuit on them, and that's just a processor with memory, so sort of like your phone. It's got a, a mini computer in it. And that actually is, you can, uh, the, the IC can actually read and write to that memory. So what that means is when the card is inserted or dipped, the um, data can change over time. It's dynamic. It's important to remember, though, that that magnetic stripe is still on the back of the card. And so sometimes when you forget and swipe your card, and if it's an EMV terminal, it'll say, please insert. The reason it knows to do that is because there's an indicator in the magnetic stripe that says, hey, I'm really a chip card. The other thing to remember is that there is lots more data coming um, in and around the transaction as compared to magnetic stripe. So the mini computer can actually secure the data with cryptography functions. And you'll often hear the data pack is referred to as cryptogram. So if you hear that term, it just means the data is secured. When we talk about the liability shift dates, it's important to understand what this is. It's not a card brand mandate. The card brands are not forcing you to do this, but it is a common sense mandate. And if you're branded, your oil brand or your fuel supplier may be asking you to do this. 
There's two dates to keep in mind. The first was October 1 of 2015. This is when all of the payment terminals except our automated fuel dispensers went into the liability shift. So inside your stores at the POS, if you have a car wash, ATMs, all of that has passed, and so you're in the liability shift. The date that we're most concerned about is October 1, 2020, 364 days from now. Now, you might remember that we got a three-year deferment, and so now it's to 2020, but this is the date that all of our outdoor automated fuel dispensers are going to go under the liability shift. So what does that mean? Well, simply put, it just means it shifts to the party in the payment chain with the least secure payment technology. But what this means for retailers is this, if you implement EMV in general, you're covered. It depends on a lot of things about the transaction, whether it's lost and stolen, counterfeit. It can depend on the card brand, whether it's Visa or MasterCard. It can depend on where it happens. But as retailers, you're generally covered if you have EMV. So this past summer, Conexus set out to figure out where we were as an industry, and we did an EMV preparedness survey. We sent this out using the NACS database contacts, our contacts. We utilized the MAG, the Merchant Advisory Group, to get this out to as many people as we could. We sent this out to 1,100 plus unique companies. We ended up with 88 complete responses representing over 26,000 sites. So it's a pretty good sample. It was geographically distributed where our stores are distributed according to the SOI. Um, we asked about a number of topics, including indoor and outdoor um, EMV, contact and contactless. And all that means is contact is where you actually insert the card. Contactless is where you wave or tap the card. So we asked about both of those, but we're going to focus on contact this morning. And then we asked about fraud in general. So a couple of um, interesting things that I wanted to share with you. When it comes to indoor, we're in pretty good shape. 100% of the respondents plan to deploy indoor EMV. And in fact, 86% are fully deployed. So that's great. Congratulations to you if you're one of those. Um, the people that haven't yet cited lack of certified software as the number one reason. Um, and software, as you know, has to be certified before it can be used in the field. So we combined, even though we asked in the survey very individual questions about software availability from vendors versus certification, we kind of put those together um, because really they're the same thing at the end of the day. When it comes to outdoor, unfortunately, um, most of you probably feel like you're alone on an island because you don't know what to do, you don't have sites deployed, you don't know how to get there. Um, while that's bad news, the good news is you're not alone. Of our respondents, 70% had zero sites deployed. Zero sites deployed for 70% of our respondents. That's big. 80% planned to deploy, and another 17% were undecided. And we're going to come back to that undecided factor in a few minutes. So staying on outdoor, um, we asked uh, if you thought you'd be ready for all of your sites by October 1 of 2020, which is our shift date, and 42% said no, or 42%, I'm sorry, said yes. So that means another 58% said they weren't going to be ready. So less than half thought they were going to be ready. Another 16% thought that they would be ready sometime in 2021, and perhaps most startling is that 25% had no clue when they were going to be ready. Coming back to our 17% were undecided about whether to implement, we asked why, and people could respond with more than one answer. Um, cost of upgrades and the risk not justifying the expense were the number one answers. So our presentation this morning is going to uh, focus on that lower right bullet point, risk doesn't justify the expense. We're going to analyze what that risk is going to be and help you understand why that's not why that's not a good reason. In fact, we estimate that in 2020, the industry is going to share $451 million in counterfeit fraud. And if you're not EMV enabled, you're going to be part of that liability. So let's move to Cara, who's going to talk to us about the benefits of upgrading to outdoor EMV. Thanks, Linda. Can everybody hear me OK? OK, great. Um, so. First, I want to explain the different types of chargebacks and who pays for what. 
So first, we have lost and stolen, and that is what us as merchants have been paying for for years. And that's obviously when your card is lost and stolen. Then there's counterfeit. That means that the card is still in your wallet, but the card, a counterfeit card has been made and is being used elsewhere and it's not authorized by you. And the banks are paying for that fraud today. So if you do not upgrade to EMV, the retailer pays for both lost and stolen as well as counterfeit. So let's look at, it, at that again because a lot of people like to learn things different ways. So today, for lost and stolen fraud, petroleum retailers are paying for those lost and stolen chargebacks. Again, we've been paying for those for years. And today, for that counterfeit, where the card is in your wallet, but, it's, but somebody's made a counterfeit card, that the banks are paying for that fraud. If you upgrade, Visa will actually help, will pay for your lost and stolen, and the banks will continue paying for that counterfeit fraud. So if you do not upgrade, petroleum retailers will pay for both lost and stolen and for counterfeit. I know it's a little bit confusing, but let me, let me break this down a little bit further. So lost and stolen is about 10% of the total fraud and chargebacks that are out there. And that's what we've been paying as retailers. 90% is, about, is counterfeit fraud, and that's what the banks have been paying for until October 1st. Now, if you don't upgrade to EMV, the retailer ends up paying 100% of the fraud that's out there. So it's a really good idea to upgrade before October 1st of 2020, especially for your, for your field dispensers, because we really don't know where that, um, what that 90% is, except for the fact that we're going to give you some numbers that we were just able to obtain. So. so check with your fuel brand or your fuel supplier first because they may have requirements before October 1st of 2020, just to be sure that you know exactly when your liability shift date is because your indemnification could end before that date. So we want to call attention. Why would you pay for chargebacks? and then pay for your upgrades if you waited until after 2020. The question is, can you afford both? So together, let's identify how to get ahead and justify that investment in EMV, as long as you upgrade. So here's Jim to talk about to upgrade or not to, and the decisions that he, did, he made at uh, Folk Oil. Thanks, Cara. We're just going to talk through some, some simple steps that we implemented on our end that, that really seemed to help and if you guys can walk out of here today with some ideas in mind and how to go about uh, getting that completion by really like Linda said 364 days from now so at all of our uh, Citco branded sites we are 100% deployed and completed so we're uh, now accepting outdoor EMV and some of you in the audience may have may be at a point where you're meeting some resistance to spend the capital to, to upgrade your dispensers or replace your dispensers and here's just some things we'll talk through throughout the presentation and in uh, some areas of, to help you uh, come, come up with your own individual plans. So one of the avenues or areas that, that there's going to be a challenge as we go forward is on technician availability right. and, and yeah. shortage in some metro markets. I think, Kara, you've heard some stats on areas where there already yeah. is a sh shortage of supply. Definitely, yes. And that's one of the things that I think the reasons why you guys decided to get ahead, too, is because of the fact that you wanted to avoid all those all the technician backlogs. Absolutely, and it really you know it may depend on your area in the country and uh, and whatnot. But uh, again, as as the pipeline fills and we get closer and closer to this deadline, as you can imagine, there is going to be a shortage of uh, of manpower to facilitate these upgrades. Yep, and Linda's going to give us some stats a little later too on that. One of the things that uh, I would encourage you to take advantage of if you are upgrading your dispensers is um, if you're ordering a brand new dispenser. Um, obviously uh, both Gilbarco, Wayne and the others is to, to implement the, uh, the mobile payment. That's, that's a feature that uh, you have to select. It's an option when you're ordering that dispenser. But uh, we've implemented that at all of our locations and we're start, the, the demand for that continues to increase. And you can see here on the slide the stat of where those sales are going to be by 2023. But that, that, that trend is continuing to grow. I think, Kari, you're seeing that more and more on yes, your end. we are. And, and you know, in Europe, they're at, I think, close to almost 50% of that tap and pay where you can actually take your card 
renew contactless cards, and tap and pay. And the card brands have, have basically said that, that um, the card issuing banks, the next round of EMV cards, that as soon as your card expires, you're going to see more and more where it's dual purpose, where you get the chip and the contactless, you can actually use your card to tap and pay. A lot of the automobile manufacturers are starting to implement this right into their, uh, their systems as That's well. True. So yep. it's just continuing to grow. I would highly encourage you to, to make sure you select that option if you're ordering new dispensers. So it, it really boils down to um, each individual location, knowing, knowing what you have on site and then uh, forming a plan to, to facilitate what you need to do at that site to, to be ready come October 1 of 2020. Um, are, are you going to retrofit your existing dispensers? Or are you going to upgrade that dispenser to, to brand new? And then what do you have on site for your current wiring to the dispenser? Can you, do you have twisted pair that will work or do you, do you need to upgrade to new uh, category six, seven or eight cables? And that's something Carol will talk through a little bit more as we get into the presentation. As we've said, you know, do you really want to fall into that, uh, that plate where you, you'll be liable for um, those real, real dollars as Cara and Linda both talked about come, come October 1 of 2020? And now is the time to form the plan. So I would highly encourage you to, while you're here at the show, there's lots of people you can meet with if you don't know what, you're, what you need to do, but uh, spend that time wisely while you're here and, and develop a plan. Yep, exactly. And here's Cara. Thanks. Actually, I'll take this one. So one of the questions that we always get is, does EMV really work and does it prevent fraud? Um, it actually really does. So again, remember that there's a processor on the card and that processor is what enables cryptographic functions to happen on the data. And this makes counterfeit fraud almost impossible. Now remember, there's two types of fraud, lost and stolen and counterfeit. And what we're talking about with the liability shift is the counterfeit fraud coming to your stores. So EMV really helps with the counterfeit fraud. In fact, this is a stat from Visa um, on their website, public data. If you look at um, counterfeit fraud decrease from September 2015, which is right before the indoor date happened, through Q1 of 2019, there was an 87% counterfeit fraud decrease. This, my friends, is EMV at work preventing counterfeit fraud. It really does work. So again, um, we are looking at potentially $451 million for our industry in counterfeit fraud outdoors at the AFD. And it's important to realize what your share is. So we've thrown out some numbers and you're probably wondering, well, how are you coming up with these numbers? And quite frankly, we're glad you asked because I'd be happy to explain them. So we took, um, undertook, Connexus undertook to get from the card brands what the industry was facing today in counterfeit fraud. So of the four major card brands, we got data from three of them and we were able to project out the fourth. In 2018, we were looking at actual fraud numbers at our dispensers of $299 million. We're looking at a 23% year-over-year increase, and this was borne out by the data because we got 2018, all four quarters, we got Q1 of 2019, and from one of the brands, we got Q2. And we were able to see over time, over the quarters, we're looking at an average 23% increase. That's huge. When you calculate that out, we're looking at 367 million in 2019 and 451 million in 2020. Those are large numbers. And those are the, those are the numbers that the banks have been absorbing on our behalf and that's gonna all switch to the retailer that doesn't upgrade, right? That's right, absolutely. So again, that's 451 millions that we project in 2020. And as EMV gets rolled out, the fraudsters aren't going to go away. They're just going to seek new avenues. So if your competitor across the street, if different regions upgrade to EMV, then that EMV is going to, or that fraud is going to migrate to your sites that are not EMV compliant. And in fact, today where we're seeing a lot of the fraud as well as skimming is kind of around the, the border of the U.S. So if you look at I-10 from California, Arizona, Texas into you know, the panhandle, and then you go up the I-95 corridor. These are hot spots. And it's very easy for the, those of you in the middle of the state to be very complacent and say, you know, I don't see skimming, I don't see fraud, I don't see why I should upgrade. Well, again, the fraudsters are going to now target those rural areas, the interior of the U.S., as these are shored up. 
If you have a competitor across the street that has enabled EMV, the fraudster is now going to go across the street and target you. So it's very important to understand what you're facing, even if you're not seeing something today. And it may be that you're not seeing any of your numbers because, as Cara mentioned, the issuers are eating that data for you today or eating that fraud. But on 364 days from now, that's coming to you. So we wanted to take a look at what potentially liability per site you're looking at. And there's, um, what's important here is to look at the trend. So the, the um, orange line is the percentage of stores without EMV. And you remember from our survey stat, 58% by 2020 expected to not have EMV. So if you look at this over time by quarter and assume that every quarter more stores come online with EMV, and, and we know that at some point, you know, that, that will never go to zero, but hopefully it'll come down. What happens is if you look at the blue numbers, which are the projected liability per quarter, and after 2020, we've assumed no year-over-year -year increase. So that's very conservative. Remember that we were looking at 23%, but for the sake of this example, we said it wasn't going to go up, which is probably not likely. Um, by the end of 2022, you're looking at over $10,000 is your share per quarter if you haven't upgraded, and that's per store. So again, uh, $451 million projected in 2020. We know that fraud is going to go to the non-EMV stores, and this is your annual projected liability per store in 2021 and 2022, um, and that comes right off that graph. It's just totaling up the quarters. So we wanted to take a look at um, the ROI that you might actually um, see. So in this example, we chose a finance example, and we used $55,000 uh, to upgrade your site. Now, that's probably low if you're going to be replacing dispensers. It may be a little high or on park if you're going to just use retrofit kits. But if you take a look at um, $55,000 over seven years at 8%, which is probably a little bit high, um, some of the finance companies tell me that that's, that's um, a little bit lower finance rate right now. You're looking at an average payment of just $11,000 or less. So that's that blue bar as you go across. That's steady. That doesn't change over time. Over the next seven years, that's going to be your yearly output. But the fraud you avoid in red goes um, up, and then it, it uh, stays steady. But what that means is your ROI over time is huge. So by avoiding the fraud, you're actually ahead $127,000 at the end of seven years. Now, this is one example. Your actual numbers are going to change. You're going to want to look at your fraud numbers, and Cara's going to talk about how to get those. You're going to want to look at your sites and make a decision on whether you need to upgrade, replace, retrofit kit, et cetera. But this is an example, and, and this is pretty good numbers and pretty good ROI. Another example, same 55,000 um, example, except you pay for it outright. Your ROI the first couple of years is very low, but over seven years, you actually come out ahead because you're not paying the interest charges. So you're looking at $146,000 savings. Again, we would encourage you to run your own numbers, but from this example, you can see that the liability fraud that you're going to avoid does have a good ROI on it. So just to reiterate, 127,000 in our example if you finance, 146,000 if you use cash. And again, um, the potential chargebacks over the next seven years from that data that we just looked at, you could exceed $201,000 per site. That's real money. Uh, so next up, we're going to help you figure out how to analyze your own ROI and upgrade benefits, and Cara's going to walk us through that. Thanks, Linda. So as Linda said, we're just using averages here. So we were, Connexus was able to get the, in, the industry information from the card brands and weave it into the Connexus survey, which I think is huge. I think this is the first time that we've actually seen some, some, some pretty good numbers on this. And I can't stress enough, you need to get your own numbers because the question you have to ask yourself is, can you afford to wait? And can you afford that financial impact? What I mean is that if you wait until October 1st to say, hey, you know, I'm just going to kind of wait and see what my, my chargebacks are going to be, and then, you, and then you go, holy cow, I'm going to have to upgrade, and then you upgrade, you've literally thrown 
all that money that you just incurred on those chargebacks out the window. Because why, why did you wait to then spend the money? Because you incurred, you incurred chargebacks and then the upgrade. And so you've got to look at the risk versus the reward. The risk in this case is that you pay for 100% of those chargebacks. Remember, we've only seen 10% as retailers. The banks have been absorbing 90%. And if you don't upgrade, you get 100%. And that's, I mean, that's, that's a big deal, folks. If you upgrade before October 1st of 2020, you're obviously going to get upgraded fuel dispensers. We all know that when you upgrade your sites and do site improvements, you get an automatic lift right away, right? Everybody nod with me, yes, that's normally true. And you get new technology. Jim talked about contactless, get the tap and pay. Look at all the other features. I know you talked about the fact that you looked at the different technologies and, and for each store and what you, should in, what you should upgrade to. Also, you're going to meet the consumer demands. The consumers um, are, are going to ask, why, did you not, why don't you care about my card at, at the fuel dispenser? Why are you not securing my data? And then, obviously, the big benefit here that we're talking about today is the reduced chargebacks. So there's a huge upside here. To obtain your own counterfeit fraud, this is, this is the key. And again, if you obtain data from 2018, your store might be very little or even possibly zero. But as Linda talked about, you're going to have that big U. They're going to come down I-5 down in California, across I-10, up 95. And once that's all covered, because those are the higher fraud areas, everything's moving inward. And so if you've not seen fraud today, you might have your lunch handed to you on a silver platter, and we don't want to have that happen. So you can obtain your counterfeit fraud amount, ask your major oil brand, ask your fuel brand, or ask your credit card processing company, because they have the numbers, and they can get them for you. Look for some other options for, research, for funding. So look for bundle deals. You know, we've seen buy dispensers get a new point of sale. We've seen, you know, buy a bunch of dispensers. You, did you, you probably bought in bulk, Jim? We did. I mean, obviously, if you've got lots of sites you're upgrading, you know, there, there's deals to be had. Negotiate your best deal. And in some cases, you know, some dispensers, you may say, we, we replaced some that were five or six years old, which in our industry, obviously, a lot of the dispensers have lasted 20 plus years. But we looked at the, uh, the cost to upgrade those yeah. dispensers versus replacing new. When you order a new dispenser, you may get, uh, you know, you get a longer warranty, generally two years, uh, bumper to bumper, parts and labor. So you really got to look at all the factors involved. Uh, right. But obviously, coming to the forefront now, forming a plan and not waiting because there's, there, we'll get into it here, but there's a lot of lead time involved. Yep. yep. There's a lot of financing companies here at Nax. Talk to your major oil brand, talk to your fuel brand, see if they have some incentives for you. And then, um, as Jim said, you know, look for some manufacturing specials. If you're going to go out and you're going to buy you know, 200 dispensers, you don't have to install them all the same day, but you want to get it in now. And have we mentioned, why would you pay for chargebacks and then your EMV upgrade? Can you afford both? So together, let's follow the steps to avoid counterfeit chargeback fraud. And here's Jim to talk about the steps that he went through to do his upgrades. So there's a process to this. It's going to take time. You know, you need to plan on, on a minimum four to six months from, from now till implementation. And that, that those are real numbers. So obviously, we're less than a year out. But if you plan now, you'll be ahead of the game and you'll be fully compliant come October 1 of 2020. First and foremost, it, outdoor, uh, the, the software for your outdoor, is it, is it available? Is it ready? Check on that. And if it's not, do your hardware upgrades now? Correct. And then your downtime is much less when it's just a software upgrade at that point. Look at, as I mentioned earlier, but look, look at your dispensers. You know, are you going to upgrade the dispenser or are you going to retro it with a kit? You know, that's where you meet with, meet with your local distributor, whoever that, whoever that may be, and, and form a plan. And then uh, inter internet at the forecourt, you've got to have that. Most of you probably already do, but uh, again, that's something you'll want to plan, plan for. <laughs> and then as part of that process, as I mentioned, ordering those dispensers or retrofit kits, what a great place this week to, to meet with those manufacturers if you yeah. haven't already and, uh, and uh, look at your options.
And I just, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to schedule, knowing that you've got a lot of lead time involved, but schedule uh, as we get closer to that deadline, technicians are going to be in demand. And it really depends on where you are in the country, but uh, I would highly encourage you to, to form a plan now versus waiting. I don't, sorry. There we go. <laughs> Each of your locations is more than likely unique um, in terms of number of dispensers and how your hardware and software is configured and then just the layout of each location. But, uh, you know, it starts with your own internal IT staff because they'll have to be involved in this process. Yeah. And then uh, it, whoever you use for your, for your um, upgrades, uh, meet, that, meet with those technicians, form a plan. You know, don't wait till the last minute, but uh, we'll get into it here a little bit as far as what, what, all, what are those steps involved. But uh, again, there's just, I can't emphasize enough how much lead time is involved in this. Some things you want to do, you know, prior to the actual date of installation is here, here on the slide. One, contacting your, your firewall provider, contacting your... your uh, uh, Managed network service provider. Correct. And then your, your POS profile, <laughs> know what that is. It doesn't roll off the tongue, does it? Yeah. <laughs> blah, blah. But some of that may, not, may or may not apply to you in terms of obtaining permits. You know, that may be something you, you have to do, it may not. But uh, those are just some simple things you want to do, again, prior to that date of installation. These are, these are simple, you've all heard these before, but uh, just knowing that, uh, especially that when you do the upgrades, that there's gonna be some downtime, so be patient. Um, I can't emphasize enough how, much, how important it is to follow the implementation guides that are provided right. to the technicians. Um, your own IT staff should be aware of what those are and should study them along with the, the, uh, the, the technician that's doing the installation just so they know and those steps are followed step by step. Um, everybody likes to cut corners now and again, but it's important in this, in this process not to cut any corners, follow each step. In the software, when you get, finally do get it implemented, it's, it's new, especially if you, if you don't have the outdoor EMV right now, you'll, you'll see that that process at the dispenser is, um, it's just different. It's different for your cashiers and it's different for your customers. So first and foremost, train your cashiers, show them how it works. And then um, one thing we did at our dispensers is we actually put put a, a sign up on a dispenser telling the customers that we've done something different um, just to bring it to their attention because again when you sit, uh, slide that card into the dispenser it has to sit there for a few seconds so it's just something different something new and like anything when you're doing these upgrades there's going to be hiccups you know plan for that things happen um, so like, again that, that that day you're doing it there's downtime and you know, it's a good time to get other things done within the store because you, you may be down a full a full day <laughs> Here's on the, on the slide, just, just some simple things that, that we followed, but you know, a lot of them are no-brainers. When you're doing these, I would highly encourage you to avoid Fridays. And it never seems like if there's a problem on a Friday and you go into a weekend and then you're dealing with it all weekend long. So uh, we, we generally, as a standing rule, we just don't do any upgrades on Fridays. Um, I, I said it before, but following that implement, implementation guide is very important. And then uh, spend the time to do the surveys at your sites before you do anything. You know, know what you have so that when you are ordering the equipment, you're, you're getting what's needed for that each, each location. And then uh, on the day of, before, before that technician that's there doing the upgrade leaves the site, you know, test and verify that everything is working like it's supposed to at each dispenser. That's a good time to train your employees how things work. Um, and then have them stay, you know, they, okay, they say they're all done, we're ready to go, it's four o'clock, they can't wait to get out of there, but pay to have that technician hang around for an extra hour because that's generally when things happen, things go wrong. Yep. Kara, I think you've seen some of that, yep. those happen across the yep. country. Yep, yep. It's worth it to spend that extra time, or extra dollar. So as we've said already, you know, c can you really afford to upgrade or afford not to upgrade? As uh, we've said, that, that, that liability is going to shift. I know that dates change a lot over the years, and everybody says, oh, it'll change again, but this time it's not. And we, we just wanted to get ahead of it, and I'm glad we did because now we're, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of coasting. So, so we're, we're happy and we're pleased, and I would highly encourage you, to, like I said, just take that time while you're here to, to walk away from the show with a, with a plan in mind. Yep. And a lot of times, too, you know, a lot of people feel like if they do the site survey that with their technicians, that their technicians are trying to sell them something. And I think at this stage, everybody has your best interest at heart. And so, yes, there may be a little bit of selling, but they're also trying to, to make sure that you're future-proofing your sites as well. 
So, so take all of that into account. Really rely on your, your field dispenser, distributor, your manufacturer, and have them help guide you. They've done this all over the world, and the U.S. Is, is the last place that they're doing this. So let's identify some additional upgrade requirements. As we've talked about a couple times, you most likely need to upgrade the broadband between your fuel dispensers and your point of sale and your fuel controller inside the store. And the reason for that, as Linda talked about, there's a lot more data, and we recommend business grade. A lot of the brands, a lot of, a lot of um, fuel, fuel distributors have a certain broadband that they require. So make sure that you are adhering to that because, folks, if you're going to run video, if you're going to run all of these other things, um, it, it really takes a lot more bandwidth. And I can't emphasize enough that um, to make sure that, that the technician, if you're pulling new cable if you, that they're, and you're running new conduit, that you're running it far enough apart so that your electrical noise does not affect your payment and your video noise. We've actually seen that happen, and it's, it's, it's tough when you've ripped up concrete once and you've got to go back and you've got to rip it up again. It's, it's, it's very detrimental. So, so again, you know, I know when you did your upgrades, you were there with your technicians working kind of side by side with them, and so that was very advantageous for you. Good, good idea, too, is if you're pulling new cable, if you have to do that, you know, pull a spare cable. It, it yeah. never hurts. You never know what you might need, need in the future. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so there, there is one other mandate. This one is a mandate. So if you are not going to be upgrading your hardware at the dispenser before October 1st of 2020, you need to upgrade your pin pads, if you haven't already, to what we call triple debit encryption standard. We call it triple DES or TDES. And now those are the keypad, as a rule, general rule, I should say, the keypads have look like that, or they have individual buttons on them. And that is, um, that is for debit encryption. So if you do not have these installed by October 1st of 2020, you, you will have to disable pin debit at the dispenser. Now, flipping forward to the next slide, this is sort of, this is a, again a, a general practice of what the single debit encryption standard pin pads look like. It's, it's that membrane, it's that one piece of plastic that has like the little bubbles on it. Those are typically single DES or, or S DES, and those have to be removed or replaced, or you have to disable pin debit. Now, if you upgrade to EMV, which is obviously our message today, then you get triple DES, so you don't have to worry about it. But if you're not going to upgrade your, fuel, your pin pads and your fuel dispensers before October 1st, you need to know this. So. And I would caution you that if you do not upgrade to EMV but you put in triple DES, you will still get all those EMV chargebacks. Remember we talked about, can you afford that upgrade? Because it just makes more sense to upgrade to EMV <coughs> rather than upgrade just the pin pads. So... 450 million is projected for fraud in 2020. Even if you update to triple DES, you still will incur your fraud. So how much will you be liable for? So let's make good business decisions to avoid those long-term costs. And here's Linda to talk about some technician helpful hints. So when it comes to technicians, we know that um, t technicians are in short supply. The demand definitely exceeds the supply. Um, one of our colleagues went and looked through the job openings and found 700 plus fuel technician job postings last month. So clearly um, there's a shortage of them. The lead times you need to consider, right now we're hearing um, six to eight weeks in some places and that's only gonna get longer as more and more people implement EMV. Um, as Jim mentioned, your downtime during installation is a lot longer. Um, they take many hours, even a day. So plan on that downtime, but what that means is the technician then can't service as many sites in a day. So again, all kind of contributing to the shortage. And then of course, as we start coming into the holiday period, Thanksgiving into Christmas, you know, you're not gonna wanna be in the middle of upgrades. For those of you in the northern climates, I'm sorry, I live in Florida. Um, but for those of you that experience snow and ice, um, you're not going to be able to break concrete during those months. So all of those things are going to contribute. I also wanted to share with you, um, PEI did a survey this past month, and they just finalized the results, so I don't have it on the slide, but I want to share a few stats with you. 
Um, first, the shortage of skilled technicians was the number one disappointment of the year for PEI members. And PEI members are a lot of the um, fuel distributors, jobbers, et cetera, and the equipment manufacturers um, and distributors. 80.6% of PEI members sort of cited the shortage of skilled technicians as their number one disappointment. And they asked, looking over the next 10 years, um, more people uh, said the shortage of qualified technicians was easily the biggest business threat. And they had an average score of 8 out of 10, 10 being a major threat. So clearly PEI members are concerned about the technicians and they're the experts in this area. I also wanted to mention they asked some, some generic questions and I thought it was interesting because their survey respondents, and I don't know how many there were or how many sites they represented, but they expected 59% of their customers to be compliant by the October 1, 2020 deadline, which is higher than what the Connexus survey found. However, that number, they asked the same thing a year ago, and that number came down significantly um, from 65%. So clearly, um, I think we were overly, or they were overly optimistic. Um, so even though those numbers are a little bit different between the two surveys, it's still around half, and those numbers have come down for the PEI members as well. So together, <clears throat> excuse me, we can work uh, for successful outdoor EMV upgrades, and Cara is going to talk to us about purchasing or financing. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, so we have a lot of great opportunities here because we are at NAX. As Jim said, we've got all the fuel dispenser manufacturers are here, all the point-of-sale vendors are here, and so are the financing companies that can help you finance. So. Some of you look at things, I'm sure, as, as um, Dick Folk did from Folk Oil, looked at, you know, do we purchase, do we finance, what's the best use of our cash, how does it look on our balance sheet? And so there's a couple different options, is that if you, if you purchase new dispensers, you have the ability to capitalize and depreciate that on your financial statement, and a retrofit kit would be an expense. However, as we've shown, whether you purchase or finance, the return on investment based on the average $55,000 investment is definitely worth it over the seven year period. Now, for financing, it's, it's, it's great because you can actually manage your cash flow much better. And as I've mentioned about three times now, there's, there are companies here at NAX. Please talk to them to, talk, to find out if you have some, uh, if you're interested in financing options. So upgrade today and avoid those counterfeit chargeback fraud. Upgrade now. We can't emphasize that enough. Now, now is the time to, to at least start forming your plan. Just some simple steps here and uh, things we've already talked about. But uh, as I mentioned, plan and meet with both your internal staff, your IT people, and, and, and technicians, whether those are in-house or you're using somebody to, to, to handle that. But uh, the individual site plans are what's most important. Up, up, you know, upgrading your POS software, scheduling technicians, verifying that you have the right internet at, at your dispenser. Um, and if you don't, you know, it's, again, as Kara mentioned, and Linda with the weather, some of you that are in the, the colder weather climates, that's something you have to plan for once, uh, once the uh, weather allows. So knowing that, that, that it's all part of your timeline and there's, there's uh, lots of steps involved and then ordering, uh, and ordering those dispensers, you know, as, as you can imagine, that lead time for a dispenser order is only going to increase with more and right. more people getting on board. So the best place is today is to start and go meet with uh, whoever you need to to uh, start that, that plan of action. But uh, complete it all by October 1 of 2020 because that, that fraud will find you. You know, that was one of the things that really, uh, quote unquote, scared us is that we just didn't want uh, well, any of that to hit us. But that, as Linda said, that, that fraud's going to migrate to places where uh, opportunities exist. So don't delay. Start your plan of action today and then upgrade your outdoor EMV. So make sure you plan at least four to six months. And overall, you really need to ask yourself whether or not you can um, afford not to upgrade. So some takeaways I hope you learned today. Um, the risks associated with waiting to convert. 
Um, hopefully we've given you some information that you can go out and get your own cost so that you can estimate what is, what's going to happen if you don't upgrade by, 20, by October 1 of 2020 and that you're able to analyze some of the best practices from Jim and, and some of the other things that we've shared. We do want to leave you with some resources. So Conexus.org website. Um, under resources, there is an EMV resource page. And on this particular page, page is a brand new updated resource guide for EMV. And what this does is bring together a collection of um, webinars, white papers, um, anything you can think about EMV broken down by topic. So things you need to consider as you're looking at how to upgrade to EMV and things like how do I do loyalty with EMV? Um, you know, uh, you name it, it's in there. Brand newly updated. Um, it's not necessarily Conexus information. Some of it is from webinars, but it's like the US Payments Forum and other, some of your vendors have some good information. So it's a good starting point. Um, the survey that we talked about that we did this summer, the full survey results are out there. I brought you just some minuscule data points out of it. So if you're interested in that, be sure to check out the full survey results. Um, Conexus does webinars. We're going to be doing two EMV webinars in December. If you don't get e or if you don't get webinar notices, send us a line or send us an email at webinars at connexus.org. We'll get you signed up for those. And again, two webinars in December. One thing that I failed to put on the slide is that the Nax magazine is going to be featuring an article on EMV in their December issue. So lots of good information coming in the next few months. Today at the NAC show, so the expo opens up, I think, at 11.30 today. Um, all of your vendors and all of the people you need to talk to about EMV are here. Take this opportunity to go talk with them, whether it's your POS vendor, your EPS vendor, dispenser manufacturers, your distributors, your managed network providers, finance companies. This is an awesome opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with the people that you need to talk to about how to get this done. Um, if you have questions that we don't get to today, or you just want to visit more or chat about EMV, Conexus is down in 3755. We'd be happy to chat with you. And with that, we're going to open this up for Q&A. We've got 13 minutes left. If you want to ask a question, I will ask you to go to the microphones. The session is being recorded. And if you don't go to the microphone, the recording doesn't hear the question. Tim. So you're showing like enormous populations, actually 43%, if I remember your numbers correctly, that are not even planning on doing an outdoor EMV upgrade. I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about the business case from a Visa or card brand perspective. How can they dump chargeback fees on 43% of their population in the C-Store industry? It just seems like it'd be an enormous loss of revenue to them. Yeah, so I think what you're quoting, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the 42% don't plan or can't be ready by the, the liability date. Um, we know that's a risk to the industry, um, and we are working on you know, ways to help those merchants. Um, unfortunately, the reason that a lot of them are not going to be compliant is because there's just not solutions available. So for example, um, in conjunction with the Payments Forum and uh, Visa and some of the other card brands, we've actually been working on how to streamline certification. So one of the things that has to happen today is that an end-to-end -end or L3 certification needs to happen with all of the equipment from start to finish, you know, from the time you swipe your or insert your card to the time it goes up to the um, issuer for approval. So by working with the card brands and forums like the US Payments Forum, we're able to bring everybody together at the table and try to work out a solution that helps the industry. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, but the, my, 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 the question really is, it goes back to the idea that most people think, hey, it's going to be another delay. It was mm -hmm. 2017, now yeah. it's 2020. How can Visa make a good, or any of the card brands for that matter, actually make a decision where I'm going to dump all these chargebacks on 42% of my uh, C-stores and, and actually have it stick? I mean, they would just be cutting off, it would be a... a massive bleeding for them. Yes. So we're well aware that there's a certain percentage of merchants out there that just can't get upgraded, not due to anything that th is their fault, that it will likely put them out of business. And we're well aware of that. Um, there's no indication that there's going to be any kind of extension or um, 
I, I think there's an opportunity for us to continue with the car, working with the card brands to provide some relief for those merchants that just simply can't get there. Um, what that is going to look like and if that happens is yet to be seen. But I think um, that would only be for the case where people can't legitimately upgrade. For those who have solutions available and choose not to, there would be no reason to try to find relief for those. The other thing you can do too as a merchant, and I mentioned this earlier too, is that do everything you can today to be EMV ready. So if you know that your EMV software is not going to be ready until first quarter 2020 or even next summer, um, do, do all your hardware upgrades today because then it's, then it's literally a software upgrade. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. It's a little bit more complicated, but, but not much more. It's not like you have to be down for a day or two to do your entire dispenser upgrades plus then your point of sale upgrade. So do everything you can today and be as ready as you possibly can. And so when that software is ready for you, then you can upgrade and it'll be much quicker and it'll be much simpler and it will definitely reduce your downtime. So I can't emphasize that enough to do, do all that you can today to be ready. So when that software is ready, you're ready to go. And as a merchant, work with your oil brand, especially if you're branded, because they can help you, you know, figure out when your solution is on the roadmap. Yep, right? or your payment processor if you're unbranded as well. Yeah, yep. right. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I was, uh, you mentioned CAT 6, 7, and 8 for connectivity to the dispensers. Uh, what's your opinion or um, experience with the encrypted wireless solutions like Avalon and some of those companies have? I think, it's a, I think it's a very good solution. Uh, I think that um, I'm not endorsing, but I, but I have seen it. And I know that the field dispenser manufacturers, you need to check with them to make sure that, that it's, it works for them. But from what I'm hearing is that they are also in full agreement that that is a great solution. Um, and, and the way that it is um, encrypted and keyed is definitely unique. So that, that certainly helps because we're always looking at the whole crux behind um, EMV upgrades is data security, right? And, and that also has its own element of security. What's, is there anything needed to maintain your EMV compliance? Do you have to maintain serial numbers of the individual devices, keypads? card readers, anything like that? Yeah, that, that's actually a PCI requirement in, in uh, Section 9 of PCI. And so they call that asset tracking. So you do have to track all devices that, um, that, that have payment cards flowing through. It could even be like your fuel controller, right? All your pin pads and things. But, if you, but you're right. Some of the EMV options and the technology upgrades like, like you were talking about, look at your options because I, th I believe the fuel dispenser manufacturers um, do have some do have some programs available, some enhancements, and that can help you with that asset tracking to meet your PCI compliance. So let's say a dispenser, it's not the serial number of the dispenser, but the serial number of the card reader or keypad within the dispenser. That device. correct. That is your PCI compliance, and of okay. course, of course, the, all the new dispensers have have different tamper proofing things that that can certainly help with with the oh. skimmers and the shimmers. And to clarify, that is not what, sh what PCI is separate from EMV. So if you're PCI compliant, you're not necessarily EMV compliant, vice versa. Um, to remain EMV compliant, you just have to make sure that you get the upgrades as needed. The software that runs in there is called a kernel, and those kernels expire over time. So okay. you just need to make sure that your kernels are properly maintained. Okay. Um, but by working with your distributor or your vendors, they can push down the upgrades to you. Go ahead. I wanted to ask a, a more detailed question about site surveys. Did you use your own team to do those, or did you use the pump techs in, in order to get a qualified individual site survey? Combination of both. Who wrote, who wrote the script as to what you needed, you or them? I would say more them. Okay. And, and you know, looking at that implementation guide, there's some steps in there to just to, to know exactly what's needed from a from an infrastructure standpoint in each individual location, and that's where it gets down to, again, having your own team and somebody from the outside looking at each one on a case-by-case -case basis. Because a lot, of, a lot of older facilities don't have more conduit readily available, and oftentimes we forget right. about that, and then we find out it's install day, but there's no cable. Yes. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Chuck. I have a couple questions. One, 
Uh, do you think zip code requirement is any kind of stopgap measure in the meantime? And two, similar to or previously to indoor chargebacks, we had our loss prevention teams kind of analyzing video and fighting these chargebacks. We're not really fighting these outdoor ones now because they're not on us. Do you think there's going to be an avenue with video or any other data to fight these chargebacks? And, and will that be a viable stopgap if we're not there? Well, I think you're going to. I think you're going to continue to see AVS continue as a prompt. Um, it, it depends on the situation. So, um, and one but of, one of the things I've heard about AVS is that in some of the high fraud areas, even after you implement EMV, it still might be a requirement. Um, so it, it really varies by location and brand, and so that's something and, that you're going to need yep. to and some check. Of the, some of the, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the card brands are requiring zip code verification in some of the, the metropolitan areas with high fraud. So um, some, of those are, some of those ABS or address verification zip code um, entry is required by the card brands. Fight some of these chargebacks. I know in the past, inside our loss prevention teams would sit there, would get a chargeback report, and they would go through the video. And it's a, it's a time consuming process to go through, but they're able to legitimately fight some of these chargebacks and prove that it was fraud because they had the video and they submitted it. It took time, but what, what do you think about so that? So, are you talking about pre or post EMV? Like pre EMV, I mean, even on the inside, when before we were EMV and we had chargebacks, I mean, yeah. and outside, I mean, even certain types of chargebacks, we were, you know, investigating yeah. like prior to signature requirements and things like that. Our loss, they would get video, they would go to the insurance companies or the banks or whoever and say, I got the video of the guy outside. Like he gave his card to two other guys and let them fill up. Those two are not fraud fraudulent, so you can't charge us for those. I think there's, uh, well, Cara may have another opinion. I think there's a good opportunity there. Um, certainly, you know, there's always been a question of, so counterfeit versus lost stolen, as Cara mentioned, you know, one today the issuers are eating and the other the merchant is eating. So, you know, there's always an opportunity if you get uh, lost and stolen, you know, is that really lost and stolen or is it counterfeit? Um, I would encourage you to, you know, any chargebacks that you get to take a close look at them. Um, you know, post EMV, if you're, if post liability shift date, if you're EMV enabled, it, in some ways it becomes a moot point because you're not on the hook except for some lost and stolen from some card brands. Right. Visa is going to cover your lost and stolen inside and out at, if you implement EMV. Terry? Just, just to build on his point, what we saw, yes, the answer to your question is yes. Fight the target guys. You may not win, but what we saw in 2015, and, and understand what the fraud liability shift is. There's not one big switch somewhere that somebody throws. It's the issuing banks today see a counterfeit fraud transaction and they absorb it. Those issuing banks, over 5,000, are going to ch update their software to now charge it back to the merchants. And what we saw in 2015 were, let's just say, software problems. But there were, we know merchants outside of Petro that had chip card transactions processed in a chip terminal that were charged back as non-EMV. So yeah. the, I saw yeah, very the, large merchants yeah. screaming yes. about that. And I, I mean, stuff happens. When it comes to software, stuff happens. But I would encourage every merchant to continuously. Today, Monitor. October, yeah. next year, and, and is yeah. to keep looking at your chargebacks, make sure that they're valid, and if you don't think they're valid, challenge them. And make sure that when, you know, Thanks, one of the sir. things that we saw with indoor was the chargebacks were occurring after October 1, but yet the transactions were Before. prior. And we even so, saw a few pay at the pump chargebacks yeah. when it shouldn't have been pay at the pump. So, so yeah, to Terry's point, you're going to have to continue to monitor, but, but we know that EMV works based on the fraud reduction we're seeing, so hopefully... The, the amount that you'll have to monitor will be significantly less. Okay. Um, we've got time for one more question. So my question is about the software configuration. So once you have the dispensers upgraded, you have chip-capable readers, um, typically those readers aren't put in EMV mode, so we're not uh, saying to leave the card in and pull it out. So as a, as a POS software provider, we're kind of looking for some guidance on how you guys, I, I like your idea of the sign on the dispenser, hey, something's changed, something's new. So as we've rolled out you know, our EMV capable devices and on the forecourt, uh, we struggle with that. Customers have uh, 
you know, they want to dip it in real fast. Yeah. And it's not a, it's not a mag stripe card reader, you know, so just that switching from a vertical to a horizontal insertion. So what is your strategy? You know, even though your equipment's upgraded, are you actually forcing it into EMV mode? And do you have any guidance on configuring the system to not allow fallback to mag stripe? So do you not support mag stripe reads any longer? Yeah. Uh, when will that date occur? There's been some new guidance on um, fallback that, that you should probably research because it's relatively new. And, um, but, you know, it, it, fallback is, is, is different. So we think of fallback historically as when your communication goes down and it goes into stand-in mode. Um, but, but we have to change our, our mindset because fallback in the EMB world means that your chip didn't work and after three attempts, you could fall back and use the mag stripe. And so in that particular case, um, I know for us, we have said we've, we've, not even, we've disabled fallback at the dispenser and it's either it works or we say, please see a tenant and go inside because otherwise I think you're gonna have, that's, that's one of the loopholes that, that we identified. And um, I'm looking at my, my tech guy right here and he's <laughs> changed our language so that it actually doesn't say, you know, it just says chip reader, fi chip read failed, please see a tenant. So those are the things that we're doing to help that. And I will add that Connexus, along with NAX and probably the Merchant Advisory Group, has something on our plates to look at how we can help educate the industry as a whole, not just the industry, but our consumers, so that they understand as more and more sites go EMV enabled, how can we help the retailers you know, get that message out to their customers? So, so look for that in the coming months. Um, with that, we really need to close because we're over. We're over. Um, a couple of closing remarks. You will receive a short survey. You need to fill that survey out in order to get the slide deck. We hope you liked us. Um, you if you're us. interested in Vote purchasing. <laughs>